We are going to be in Revelation 7 again. And if you had a chance to get your sheet and your prayer list. But let me give you a few of the announcements. Uh, the children are doing another campaign for the t-shirts. A lot of you signed up for those, and we've had enough sign up uh, for, to make another order. But if you want a t-shirt, sign up out there. Uh, we're still giving for our Myers-Mallory Myers -Mallory offering for state missions over here. Our goal is 1000 Be sure and pray about what God would have you to do. Uh, vacation Bible School, we still need a few number of items for food. If you want to sign up to help with food, uh, again, the sign-up sheet's out here in the hallway. And um, my class, I've had a few people go, hey, uh, I can't sit there for three hours. I'm like, well, I can't stand there and teach for three hours either. So we're going to go from 7.30 to 8.30. It's not going to be, you know, that gives everybody time to go and get a hot dog or whatever they're feeding us at the time. If you want to see the kids sing and dance, you can welcome them coming here and do that. And then at 7.30, we'll make our way right over in this area. And at 8.30, we'll wrap it up. And um, that way, when the kids let out, some of them come in here and sing and dance again and do all that stuff. And we won't be in their way. And you, you won't be crippled up by the time you had to walk out. Um, baby bottle boomerang is still going on until Father's Day. Uh, then the uh, youth on missions, let's see, I hadn't seen this. All the youth are going to meet at the church and go to the minister to the kid, minister to kids at Valley Rescue Mission. That's going to be June the 18th at 5:30. So uh, that'll be in our bulletins coming up as well. And you'll have a minute to find out about the details. Hooray for teachers collecting Kleenexes. And, um, you know, that, the, the basket's right out here. And y'all have already given us so many. Thank you. And we just, just keep it coming. We'll keep doing it. And that's the announcements. All right. We're going to look at Revelation chapter 7. We're picking up in verse 13. And we're going to work our way. But... Just for right now, we're going to go to 13 and 14 in our text. And this is where we left off. Then one of the elders addressed me. Now, we just got through seeing all these people in heaven, just thrones of people in heaven. So John is standing there in awe of all the different people, of all different tongues and all different nationalities from all over the world that are standing before God, and he's in awe. And then one of these 24 elders, you all remember these guys, they're, they're amazing, you know, they, they're, they're, they got their own thrones, their own crowns, of course they cast them at Jesus' feet. But they're impressive beings in heaven. So one of those guys, John's just standing there marveling at this whole scene. And one of the elders addressed me saying, Who are these clothed in white robes? And from where have they come? And I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Let's pray. Father, we come before you wanting to understand better this challenging book. But God did also did not just to understand it, to be encouraged and lifted up by it, because this is not all there is, and there's so much more ahead. And thank you for this glimpse into your throne room. Thank you for this glimpse into heaven. And God, we just glorify your name for it. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. So one of the elders goes up and asks him to identify the multitude. And John's like, I don't know. You know, I mean, what else can he say? And he's like, you know. So that, that's a way of saying, you know, would you please explain to me? I have no idea what I'm looking at, this amazing scene that's going on. These are the people that have gone through all the horrors of tribulation. You remember when the lamb was found worthy to open the seals, and he's breaking the seals, and we had the four horsemen come through, and the four horsemen of the apocalypse, which just means unveiling. It doesn't mean anything with zombies or anything. And this unveiling of the four horsemen come to war, and they bring war, they bring famine, they bring pestilence, they bring all this death. So these are the people, they're in the throne room of God, they have gone through all of this. And they were martyred, they were killed. 
But during this time, this intense wrath and judgment, God stopped the winds, sent the angel to stop all the death, stop all the destruction, and sent them in there to bring peace for a moment. Grace came in for a moment. In the middle of judgment, God's wrath justified in every way, God still in His kindness and mercy brought grace back on the scene. And that's when we saw 144,000 Jewish evangelists, 144,000 representing all the 12 tribes of Israel, and they come to Christ and they, they begin to, to be evangelists, spreading the gospel of Christ around the world. But it's during this time of peace that we're looking at. So when during this time of peace, during the tribulation period, all kinds of it, a great awakening happens all around the world. And multitudes of people from all nations, from all over the world, start getting saved. And they start giving their lives to Jesus. And those are the people John is looking at when the, one of the 24 elders comes up to him and says, Who are these? And so these are those that went through. And it, the salvation that had to happen for them to be saved is the same message for your salvation today and was the same message for salvation of those in the past. It's always been this way ever since. God has never changed the method of salvation. You say, what about the Old Testament? The method didn't change. It's just a different time period. Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. And that started us down a path of having sacrifices to pay for sin. And that's the whole story with Abel, Cain and Abel. They were given sacrifices. Abraham was told to sacrifice his son, and thankfully God provided. It was a test that he passed, and God provided a ram because there was going to be a sacrifice. Israel and the sacrifices going into the tabernacle and then going into the temple, they have always had these blood sacrifices coming along and they would shed the blood of a lamb, an innocent animal, to atone for their sins. That was for a reason, folks. That was pointing and leading up to the ultimate sacrifice. Because what did they call Jesus when they said He was worthy to open the seals? Behold the lamb, the lamb, the, the pet lamb. Remember, we looked at it in the Greek. It's a pet lamb. And so the pet lamb, this little innocent little lamb Jesus represents, people go, and I've had a lot of people ask me this, and some of you in here, well, what about the people in the Old Testament on, the, on this side, you know, uh, how were they saved? They looked to the same, the, I think they had an easier time than you and me. Because they were looking forward, and they were looking through the blood sacrifices to the ultimate sacrifice of the Messiah that had to happen. You and I are over here, there hadn't been a sacrifice in 2,000 years for our sins, except somebody telling you about an old Jewish carpenter in the Middle East that died for your sins. And then we're supposed to convince people, oh yeah, he died for you, and that's the way to salvation. You see, that same line coming through the Old Testament, sacrificing annually, sacrificing this and that, seeing the shed blood for their sins. When the Messiah came, they were looking forward. It's the same faith in that Messiah being the ultimate sacrifice. And that's why it's so important that people have to know that when you're a, sac when you, you're a sinner and you need saving because of your wretchedness, somebody had to pay the price. So we come over here to the cross where the ultimate sacrifice took place. And we're going to get to the point where we're going to look at possibility of rebuilding the third temple. There hadn't been a temple since 70 AD. Now here's the little secret about that whole thing. It doesn't matter if they build a temple or not. God doesn't need it. It doesn't matter. They start. I know there's red heifers. They all may have seen the news about they've got the red heifers and they got the ashes and all they need now is a few other things and then they can start the sacrifices back. And I'll hit all that in more detail later. But I just want you to know tonight, God doesn't want any more sacrifices. Jesus, according to Hebrews, is the ultimate sacrifice. We don't need to shed blood of bulls and goats anymore. That's what Jesus did. So. 
Whether you're an Old Testament saint, whether you're a church age saint, or whether you're a saint during the tribulation period, everybody gets saved the same way. Just some look forward and some look backwards, but it's always that sacrifice of Jesus that comes down to salvation. And when Jesus dies, He obtained eternal salvation for everybody that would believe upon His name. And that's what was happening with these guys. So, those on that side of the cross look back. They're trusting in their faith in Him. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 15. And if you got it in your little notes, if you don't, you make a note. This is the same message that saves everybody. Don't let anybody tell you there's another way to be saved, whether it's Old Testament saints or future saints, and oh, they had to come to God another way. This is the way. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ, here's the gospel. This is the gospel. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. What scriptures is he talking about? Old Testament Scriptures. It's a fulfillment of the Old Testament. Verse 4. So he died for our sins, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. All of this was prophesied about. And that's what I'm saying. The Old Testament saints had the Old Testament Scriptures testifying that the Messiah had to come and die and be buried and rise again. And that's what he's pointing to. So, let's look at the next verses of chapter 7 of Revelation, verse 15 through 17. Therefore, now therefore always indicating the stuff we just read earlier. Who are these people? This is who they are. Therefore, they are before the throne of God. So all of those tribulation saints, all those people that got saved during the great evangelism of the 144,000 Jewish evangelists, here's what they're doing now. They are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. And He who sits on the throne, that should be capitalized, sits on the throne, will shelter them with His presence. Talking about God. Verse 16. They still hunger, I mean, they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun will not strike them, nor any scorching heat. Verse 17. For the Lamb, the one that was worthy to open the seals, Jesus Christ, in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Well, let's camp out there for a moment. One of y'all came to me. I won't say who it was, but her initials were Mike's wife. And uh, <laughs> she, uh, you know, asking me about the wiping away of the eyes. It was a great observation on her part, and it's a great question, because... How many funerals do you hear that in? How many times do you hear that uh, talked about? In the end, he'll wipe away every tear from our eyes. He'll, he'll take care of all that for us. And, well, this context is this ain't us, right? That's true. It's not you here. So if the pastor at the funeral accidentally reads, not accidentally, but if he reads to you Revelation 7, 17, cut him a little slack. It's not about you and me, but in Revelation 21, <clears throat> verse 4, it says, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And in that context, that's the context where he says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and the first heaven and the first earth were passing away. Do you all understand? All of this is going to burn up, according to Peter. This is all going to be gone. And there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, according to 21. And the first heaven earth will pass away and the sea exists no longer so all that boom gone i also saw a holy city new jerusalem coming down out of heaven adorned like a bride for her husband that's a city coming out of heaven so every time y'all hear people say i'm going to run the streets of gold and i'm going to pearly gates and all that stuff when i'm in heaven ain't none of that heaven that's a city that comes down out of heaven to the new heaven and the new earth if you want to get technical. But let's not let that get in the way of our southern traditions. But that is the Bible. 
So the new city comes down, to the city of Jerusalem comes down, the new Jerusalem, to the new heaven and new earth. And then I heard with a loud voice from the throne, look, God's, look, God's dwelling is with men. It's like Eden all over again. They will be His people and God Himself will be with them and be their God and He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. That's the verse that is for all of us. So He's not only in chapter 7 wiping away the tears of the eyes of the, those who suffered in the tribulation and were martyred during the tribulation period. He's also going to take your little face in His hands and He's going to wipe away all your suffering and all your pain as well. So don't feel like you're getting left out. I just want to make sure we understand that in context, in chapter 7, that is the tribulation saints. But they're going to be in the heavenly presence of God. Therefore, the Bible says, they'll be before the throne of God and they will serve Him night and day in His temple. So that's where their home is going to be. So we get this idea like, well, when I die, that's what I'm going to do too. There's... Maybe, but we, you don't know. Somebody said, you know, I don't, heaven sounds boring. One, I don't think you could ever get bored praising God when you're in the presence of His holiness, okay? And you're going to be outside of time. So I don't think that's going to be an issue. I don't think anybody's going to go, man, I'm just bored. I don't think that's a thing. But... That's their job in heaven. It doesn't necessarily mean that's your job in heaven. Everybody's going to have a job to do because Jesus said, and we'll see it later, that we will rule and reign with Him. So the believers that go to heaven because they have their faith in Jesus, and if you're trying to get heaven without Jesus, you're not going to like heaven because everything in heaven is Jesus and about Jesus and for Jesus, so you have to go through Jesus or you'd rather be in hell. But in the, the point of all that is, we will rule and reign with Him. We will judge angels according to Paul. We will be doing jobs while we are there. And we just don't know exactly what that is. you know. But it's going to be wonderful. We're not going to be sitting on clouds playing harps you know, with little wings. You're not going to become an angel. And every time somebody passes away, please stop saying God needed another angel. He didn't need another angel. That, he's got all the angels He needs. Last time I checked, a bunch of them rebelled, and he's fine. He's still got a bunch of them. He doesn't take somebody's child because he needed another angel. We say stuff to make ourselves feel better. None of this is biblical, though. And I'm not trying to break anybody's spirit. It's much better to be a saint of God, ruling and reigning with God, than to be an angel. You will be demoted to be an angel at that point. Right now, we're lower than the angels, but they know we won't be forever. Because we'll rule and reign with him. All right. So, do you remember um, Sunday? Sunday we were talking about Jesus going into the temple and turning over the tables and made a whip and he ran out the money changers, he ran out all the animals. And I talked to you about the four, in the temple you've got the main area with all the, all the, the scribes, all the priests, all the guys are in there in God's presence. And then you've got the Jewish men, and then you've got the Jewish women, and then the fourth area you've got the Gentiles. They're allowed to come in here. And one of the reasons Jesus was so angry is because that's where the money changers were, and that's where the animals were, and that's where all the noise and the bartering and the hee-hawing and the honk, honk, whatever noise donkeys make, I can't do it, and cows and all that stuff and all the turtle doves, and they're all out there making all their racket and Gentiles are trying to come in and worship God but you can't imagine trying to worship God if there's a bunch of hee-hawing and money changing and junk going on so Jesus busts up in there with his whip and kicks everybody out that was Sunday I know all right the court of the Gentiles the outer court where he did all that Gentiles were not allowed to come into the presence of God. If a Gentile came into the presence of God, they would execute him. Okay? So if you got out, if you made your pilgrimage and you got in the outer court and you snuck into the main thing, they're going to kill you. They're going to kill you dead because you're not Jewish, because you're a Gentile. So when Jesus died on the cross, 
and the veil in the temple that separated everybody ripped from the top down. Not from the bottom, because a man could have gone and done that. But nobody could reach up there and grab it at the top and rip it. When Jesus died, that veil ripped from the top down, symbolizing to the world that no longer will anybody be out of the presence of God. Everybody can be in the presence of God. That signifies the fact that all people created in the image of God that come through the shed blood of Jesus can now come into the very presence of God that they were not allowed to go into. That's what Jesus did for us. And that's what you'll see during the tribulation period when He says... Who are these people? The 24, one of the 24 elders to John, he's like, you know, I don't know. And he explains who they are. Man, it's Gentiles and Jews and everybody. And where are they at? The throne room of God. Jesus made that happen. Nobody, nobody was allowed there till Jesus did that. That's why we owe everything to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There. So let's back up for a second. All right. They're in the tribulation period. Let's go back to when they're still alive. All these people that got saved. You know, they, they didn't get killed instantly. So during that time of the tribulation period, Satan, the devil, is all mad and angry, right? And what can he do to them? He can't do anything to them except kill them. Except kill them. The worst thing he can think to do is to kill him, which turned out to be the greatest thing that could ever happen to him because he sent them right into the throne room of God. They can't take our victory, y'all. They can't defeat us. They can cut your head off. They can cook you. They can eat you. But you still go be in the glory of God. We have the victory over the second death. It's the best thing that can happen. I mean, I don't want anybody to stab me and cut me up and eat me, you know. I'm not getting in line for that. That's the worst case scenario. That makes deacons meetings sound like a breeze, you know. But I, I can't lose. You can't lose. It's because of Him. And so God, they're serving Him there. Spend eternity with Him and worshiping Him. Now, let me say, all right, picture a timeline with me. The beginning of Revelation and the timelines going this way because I'm backwards from you so I'm trying to go your way and then the end of the book of Revelation and I've told you all this the book of Revelation is not linear you can't go as it is you cannot go chronologically through this book so here's what I'm saying we've got we're talking about all these people getting saved and we're fixing to go talk about the mark of the beast and how they wouldn't accept the mark of the beast. And I know I'm already running out of time, but I don't care. We're going to do it. And, and then I'm going to take you back over here. We're way over here, and they already did. So you can't go chronologically. You can't go linear. You have to jump back and forth in this book that we're looking at. And part of it is how does that work? Your God who created time is outside of time. Time means nothing to him. More than likely, time isn't just a linear timeline where you were born and you're growing old and stuff. Somehow this thing, when John got brought up into the presence... Now I'm going to get weird. When John got caught up into the presence of God, he's not on our timeline anymore. He's in the presence of God who's on the outside of time. And time probably looks cylinder to him, if anything. And so you've got the... the, 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 the Mark of the beast over here. You got this happening over here. John's seeing all this stuff. And these people are getting saved over here. And those same people are already here in heaven. And John's trying to tell you about all of it. And his brain's about to explode. And mine is too. Because this, this is the way you're trying to figure it out. And this is where everybody gets confused. Well, who are these people? Well, who are these? It can't be those people because they're back there. And it's the same people. We're just jumping back and forth. So, we're going to see these people again, but next time you see them, it's going to be back when they were alive. So just hold your horses and hang with me. All right. And, see, just because they turn to the Lord doesn't mean they're not going to suffer. 
Are you all familiar with the prosperity gospel? The prosperity gospel is a bunch of garbage, and I say that, and people always get mad at me, and I just I don't care. It's a false gospel. Why would we put up with a false gospel? A false gospel is a lie. Why would we put up a lie of a gospel? Prosperity gospel says, if you get saved, you won't have any of these problems as long as you have enough faith. And last time I checked, every prosperity gospel has dropped dead along the way telling us that. And they died of something. Usually cancer. So the idea is that you won't have any problems as long as you have enough faith. Now, if you get cancer, you must have lost your faith. If you don't have a big house and a Cadillac and a garage full of them, then you just hadn't had enough faith. So you need to send me some more money. And send me some more money, whether you got it or not, just, just put it on your credit card. God will bless it and all that stuff. This is garbage and it's an abuse of the gospel message. Look at the tribulation saints. They got saved. Their life got worse. Their lives got harder. They couldn't take the mark of the beast. So therefore, they couldn't work. They couldn't eat. They couldn't provide for their families. Their little kids looking at them starving all this stuff. You can't take care. You can't pay your bills. You can't do it. And then they start hunting you because you won't bow to their religion. We're going to get into that one world religion they're going to set up too. And that one world government. Their lives did not get better. But finally, they tasted the sweetness of death and they went into the presence of God. And I imagine they'd tell you the prosperity gospel is garbage. Because it is. One of the problems we've got with trying to figure out, some people want to say the 144,000 Jewish evangelists are the church. That's hard for me to reconcile. I can work with you. I can understand where you're coming from if you don't want to believe in a rapture. I don't agree with you, but I get it. There's plenty of scripture to make a good argument otherwise. I can understand why you want to say certain things are not literal, but are metaphorical, because there's a lot of it that's metaphorical. Not everything is literal, but it's hard to try to interpret which is which. And so we want the 144,000 to be the, the, the church and not this group during tribulation. So it's then it turns into all of the tribulation saints that are getting saved and they're in the throne room of God. It's all of those have been persecuted from the beginning of the church age until now. And the problem with this is when the, the elders said to John, who are they? He made it pretty clear who they were. That they're the ones that gave themselves, died during the tribulation, the great tribulation. So, this is, this is the issue you and I run into when we try to follow a system of end times eschatology. You have your favorite preacher. You've got your chart. He had it all timed out for you. And he's showing you the pictures and everything. Then we run into some scripture that doesn't fit. And we have to cheat to make it fit our system because there's no explanation. So what I'm giving you is I'm trying to just give you the Bible and not really follow the systems, even though I know about the systems. This is why some of the stuff you are hearing me say is a little different, because I'm not trying to follow the system. Example, tribulation period. How long have y'all always heard, most of y'all have heard the tribulation period is? You've heard me say it. How many years? Seven years. Find me that in the Bible. Now you heard me say it. I go along with it too. I said it. So don't get mad at me. I said seven years. But there's one obscure little verse in the book of Daniel that we got to stretch out to make it mean seven years. Other than that, I don't really know how long this tribulation period is other than that. So that's what I'm saying. Let's be careful. Don't get too caught up in a system to where we miss the blessing that comes from the fact that one day God is going to wipe every tear from the eye of those who are suffering because He loves us and He cared for us and Jesus died for us. Father God, we, we pray, Lord, as we continue through this book that um, You'll stretch our understanding and You'll challenge us to look and to read and to study 
And God, that we would be encouraged that when it's all said and done, when we come to the end of it all, there you are on your throne where you have always been. And Lord Jesus, thank you for loving us, caring for us, and dying for us. And thank you, Lord, that whatever the suffering is here is just temporary. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right.